Speaking of your salvation, verse 10, the prophets who prophesied about the grace that was to be yours searched and inquired carefully, inquiring what person or time the Spirit of Christ in them was indicating when he predicted the sufferings of Christ and the subsequent glories. It was revealed to them that they were serving not themselves, but you. This is so wild. But you and the things that have now been announced to you through those who preach the good news to you by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven, things into which angels long to look. This is the coolest, my favorite verse. <laughs> by far. I'm serious this time. The prophets of old were waiting in anticipation for the Messiah. And they were used as a tool through the Holy Spirit to write the divine words that the Lord was dictating to them. That's what we call the Old Testament. These prophets would write this stuff down. The Lord would tell them and then they would write in their pens wrote of the coming Messiah. But they had no idea what he was talking about. No idea. So he's, they're writing these prophecies, but it's all riddle. It's all, I'd say it was Greek to them, but it was actually Hebrew, and that's not a saying, so it's not as cool. It's just not. So they searched, and they questioned, and they searched, and they questioned, who is it going to be? When is it going to happen? Thousands of years ago, for thousands of years, they were writing about the coming Messiah, but the, the puzzle piece would never click in. They couldn't get it, right? So can you imagine when the prophets, they were real people. You guys got that? Jeremiah and Ezekiel and Daniel and Moses, these were real people who had real day jobs, who would go home at night and feel the Spirit download to them scripture. And they'd pick up a pen or whatever they had. That's not really a pen. A scratch it note. What are those things called? Papyrus, clay, whatever. And they would start writing stuff down and go, huh, what is in the world does that mean? Now, there are thousands of those what to choose from. I chose very few, and they were in your homework. So I'm curious how you guys think the prophets of old would have reacted to just these few very small verses. So that's what we're going to talk about. What in the world were they thinking when they turned around and proofread Zechariah 9 Nine. Donkeys, full-sized ones, were ridden by kings in times of peace in the Old Testament. But the, the, the prophets were looking for a Messiah specifically to overthrow human kingdoms and bring his kingdom here, right? They're looking for the second coming, our Jesus as a warrior king when he comes the second time. That's what they were looking for for the first time. Kings that are going to war are on white horses every time. So not only is the Messiah not on a white horse, he's not even on a full donkey, he's on a baby donkey. That's weird. What's it say about the Messiah? He's going to be pierced, right? And they're going to mourn for him. The Messiah, right? So why would the Messiah be pierced? I mean, isn't he supposed to be like the Lord of hosts, right? He's, he's the Messiah. He's the conqueror. And here it is. It says that he's going to be pierced when he's supposed to be victorious on all fronts. And they are going to mourn him. Does that mean he's going to be injured? And how bad? Exactly. Okay, so we're going to add to this now with the unveiled treasure. 
Because the prophets of old knew something of his suffering and glories. Peter said that in our text, didn't he? Peter is giving us a clue into something that the Old Testament doesn't tell us about these prophets. Peter says, concerning this salvation, this bizarre, amazing grace salvation, the gospel story that didn't make any sense concerning that, the prophets who prophesied about the grace that was to be yours, searched and inquired carefully, inquiring when and who, right? When they predicted the sufferings of Christ and the subsequent glory. So they were writing of the sufferings of Christ and the subsequent glories. They just didn't get it. Right? So the prophets, they knew something about it, even if they weren't putting it together. But still, it was a mystery that was veiled. Veiled to all who lived before Calvary. Did not make sense at all. The answers to all questions of the Old Testament, the answer key is Jesus Christ himself. Right? He alone held the key to the padlock of all scriptures. Jesus did. Now, these verses here tell us about this mystery of the gospel. The mystery of the gospel came at the revelation of Jesus Christ, which is the key that unlocks the padlock of the mystery of the ages. Do not think that I have come to abolish the law and the prophets. I didn't come to annihilate the law of the prophets. I came to what? Fulfill them. I came to lock the key in the padlock, not get rid of the padlock. See? I, I didn't come to, to do away with the law, to do away with the prophets. I came to unlock all those padlocks. It's me. I fulfilled them. That's what he said in Matthew 5. And still they're scratching their heads. Right? But Jesus is like, I didn't come to abolish the law. I came to fulfill the whole law. Every jot, every tittle. The word. It's me. I unlock it. I am the mystery of the ages that has now been revealed. We now have him, Peter says, right? So look at this again. It was revealed to them, verse 12 of our text, First Peter chapter 1. It was revealed to them, that is the Old Testament prophets. It was revealed to Daniel and revealed to Ezekiel and revealed to Jeremiah that they were serving not themselves, but you, church. That's like the coolest. So they knew, they knew, they didn't get it, but they knew that what they were writing, this is future forward. This is like, this is way over yonder for you, Peter says. In the things that have now been announced to you, we've been, everything's been fully announced to us through the gospel of Jesus Christ. We have the full revelation. We have the lock and the key in Jesus Christ. Write this down if you want to. This is Moses at the twilight of his life in Deuteronomy, where he recounts the law to the Israelites right before he dies. Deuteronomy 29, 29, Moses says this, the secret things belong to the Lord our God. The secret things belong to the Lord our God, but... The butts of the Bible. Contrast. Heads up. The secret things belong to the Lord our God, but the things that are revealed belong to us and to our children forever that we may do all the words of the law. What's Moses saying? There are many things about the Lord we will not get. We can't. We're finite. He's infinite. Right? We're temporal. He's eternal. There's depth and, and width and height to the Lord we're not going to get. That's what makes him God and we're not. Right? If we could figure him out, he wouldn't be God. There are things about him that we can't get because our brains are finite. But 
He has revealed to us so much about himself. So much about himself. So much. And in fact, the deeper you get in the word, the deeper he gets, the more he reveals. You just can't out study, out read, out search, out inquire about God. The more you inquire, the deeper it goes. He's a well that doesn't end. And it has been revealed to us in the word. And this is ours. We can know this. This is ours. It's a treasure. It's a gift. It's a wealth of knowledge about the character and nature of God. You know this isn't about you. You guys know that, right? This is not about you. If you read the Bible with you as the topic, you're going to get all discombobulated. This is his story. He left this for us that we would know him and we mold into his image. This is about him, not about us. Write that down. This is about him. It's him on the pages and he left it for us. I say this all the time as a gift. He did not have to keep a journal through the ages like he did, preserve it, and hand it to us. He did not, but he did. And Moses is like, look, there's a lot about the Lord we're just not going to get. But he has revealed so much to us, and the stuff he revealed to us is ours. We get to keep it. We get to know it. We get to search it out. It's ours. Now, the word, his heart, his character, everything is in here. His plans, his hopes, his heartbeat written on every single page of this Bible in a book that we have in abundance in our homes sitting on our coffee tables. The Bible. We have it. Now, can you imagine what Daniel and Ezekiel would do to get their hands on this? Therefore, preparing your minds for action and being sober-minded, set your hope fully on the grace that will be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Now, this actually flows into the next verse, which is next week's homework. So we're going to touch on this again next week so we get some context. But let's pull this verse apart anyway. Okay, fallen soldier. So, in context, Peter is talking to the church on the run, right? And they are enduring immense persecution, kind of like our Korean friends, right? Intense, real kind, the real kind. And Peter is saying, therefore, because of all of this, that you have a living hope, that you have an inheritance, that trials refine your faith, that the prophets have revealed to you Jesus Christ through the gospel that, they, that you now have. Even though you're in trials, listen, prepare your minds for action. Okay? Being sober-minded, set your hope fully on the grace. Now, questions come up in trials. We question the Lord in trials. We do. Everybody does. Even Jesus is like, ha-ha! Can this cup pass from me? That was a question, right? So even Jesus had a question. It's okay. What are you going to do? How are you going to get me out of this? What is your plan, right? These kind of questions hold our thinking captive if we do not get a grip. You have got to get a handle on that rat race in your brain. That's what Peter's talking about. Because trials really throw us off in our thinking. They do. And we can waste all of our energy worrying, 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 making us actually physically sick even, worrying in this stuff. And we can imagine the church is exhausted with fear. Now, I have written for you the King James because it helps with the flow, and I had it in your homework. So, wherefore, gird up, I love the King James, all right, I do. I love my King James so much. 
<laughs> Gird up. That's such a great word. The loins of your minds. Who says that? <laughs> it's the best. Gird up the loins of your mind. Be sober and hope to the end for the grace. So gird up. What does that mean? This word is really cool, actually. This girding up, Peter is using a metaphor for the Orients. It's actually a military term for their garments, like the Orient. Soldiers, they wore these kind of flowing robes that went all the way to the floor, but they got really in the way when you're marching and when you're trying to fight. You know, it's hard to fight in a skirt. I don't know, like, okay? So they would bunch them up and tuck them in their loins, their underwear, I have no idea. Something, the bloomers, I don't know. <sighs> See? They tuck them in, all right? Under their belts, they're girding up their loins. That's what it means. They're pulling up their skirts, they're tucking them in their belts so as to not hinder their walk so that they can fight. This is important. It's actually what the verse means. Gird up your loins so that nothing's tripping you up so that you can fight, so that you can march, so that you can move. There's something bunching up your feet, your brain. <laughs> this is what Peter's talking about. Your brain is in the way. Gird up the loins of your mind. This is like the coolest. The Lord was preparing the saints for battle. He wants them to stand strong. He's like, listen up, focus in, get your stuff together. Okay? So be sober. What's that mean? The literal definition of this Hebrew word in the Hebrew and the Greek, either way, I don't know why it says Hebrew, should say Greek, it's to be calm, temperate, and collected in spirit. It's really to be self-controlled, calm, in spirit, to be able to think straight. You know, you know, we're women. We know. Okay? We know this. We get our brain all tied up in knots, and it's like, I can't think clearly. And until you just, Lord, I need you to unknot my brain. I need some self-control going on up here in my head. That's what he's talking about. Okay? Now, specifically in trials, in difficult situations, when we really get all messed up. That's what he's talking about in context. Now, this call is to train your mind to take thoughts captive immediately. Bind up what holds you back and what drags you down. Pick up your feet and march into battle. That's really what this verse means. In your mind. In your mind. Now, your Berean challenge was kind of to think a little deeper on this. So, how can you gird up your mind in situations that make you crazy? Pray. That's great. That's right. How do you guard your mind against the enemy who wants, you to cause, who wants to cause you to believe your situation is completely helpless and hopeless? You're stuck forever. You've been abandoned here. You know, the stuff that he does because he's a jerk. How do you guard your mind against that? What do you do? The word, prayer, right? Worship. Worship is amazing for that. Start there. Right? There is three parts to it. Gird up, be sober, and hope. To set their course toward something. What are they supposed to set their course toward? This is the second time. Salvation. Grace. Heaven. Right? This is the second time in the same chapter that hope has come up. Right? Right? Remember, I told you, Peter's whole thing is to lift their eyes higher, higher, higher. Lift your eyes higher, because the whole context is these people are really, they, their life sucks right now. There's really no other way. Every aspect about their life is terrible. That's the context of this letter. Peter will constantly be lifting their heads above the fray, up. So he says, 
Girding up your mind, being sober-minded is okay, but you got to set your focus, so you got to have a goal. And it better be up, right? Look up. Look up. So set their hope in heaven, in salvation, in grace. These things that are off earth, off the ground, right? To lift your eyes up above the battle. Set your mind on things above, not on things that are on earth. Set your mind on things above, not on things that are on earth. Paul says, put on the whole armor of God. Why? Why? Stand against the schemes of the devil. Now, part of the armor is this helmet of salvation, right? The helmet of salvation, this helmet soldiers would wear for protection, obviously, right? Why is this piece important? One of the most effective weapons in Satan's arsenal is our thought life. Right? It says, listen, put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand the schemes of the devil. One of his favorite things to do is mess up your mind, your thought process, right? Wars are won and lost on the battlefield of your mind. Actually, really, that's kind of the whole of it, isn't it? You really get down to it, it really is all right here in your face in your brain. The battlefield of the mind. Now, this helmet of salvation. Jot this down. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 verse 8 ties into this. It repeats helmet of salvation, but it adds a word. 1 Thessalonians 5 8 says, but since we belong to the day, let us be sober. Same word from Peter. Putting on faith and love as a breastplate, so what covers your vitals? Faith and love, right? And the hope of salvation as a helmet. Oh, that ties into Peter too, right? Paul said in Ephesians 6 that on our head we put the helmet of salvation. Then in Thessalonians he says the hope of salvation as a helmet. Which is what Peter says. Gird up your loins, be sober, and hope. Right? So these verses kind of tie in together. This verse adds the word hope. The hope of salvation is a helmet to protect us. The helmet of salvation. Now, discouragement and shame and doubt and anger and depression, these things vie for strongholds in our mind. They're all here in our mind and they will defeat you, right? In your mind, they vie for a place, they vie for a stronghold, especially in tribulation, in hard times, in difficult seasons, when things are a bummer, which is the context of our letter, right? This is what happens. But if we gird up our minds with the hope of salvation, it puts the evil schemes to flight. It can't get in. Because you have protection, the hope, lifting your eyes higher, of our salvation. Now, Colossians, that verse we just read, Colossians 3.2 says that we set our minds on things above or we fix our understanding on things above, on our future inheritance, on our blessed hope, our eternity with Jesus. So no matter how bleak the battleground may seem down here, which it does get bleak, the hope of salvation rises us above the fray. No matter what the battleground looks like, if we can set our minds above it on the hope of salvation, it lifts your minds up into the eternal, above the battle. Peter tells us that we should prepare our mind for action. First Peter in our text, verse 13. To gird up, gather our skirts, be ready for battle, but how? How do we get ready for battle? He says, gird up, be sober, hope, how? 
put on your helmet of salvation. That's how. It is in a conscious effort. Put it on. Put it on. Now we're going to talk about that in a minute. This settles your mind sober, being self-controlled in thought, not allowing your thinking to run away with you, which is the problem, right? It's sober, self-controlled thinking. We need to prepare ourselves. Now, for the weapons of our warfare are not of flesh, but have divine power. Look at this. This is a cool verse. They have divine power to destroy strongholds. We destroy arguments and every lofty opinion raised against the knowledge of God and take every thought captive to obey Christ. That, by the way, is where that verse is. That is actually a verse. Taking your thoughts captive. Now, check this out. Our weapons, Paul says in verse 4, Look at this. Our weapons, our armor, the stuff that the Lord gives us is not of flesh. It's divine. Right? It has divine power even. Ha <laughs> ha. It's good. We need this. Divine power to do what? Destroy strongholds. That sounds fearsome. I like that. We have weapons of warfare that have divine power. It wields divine power to destroy strongholds. It's cool, right? Destroy strongholds. Now, what strongholds? That's where you got to keep it in context or you can add all kinds of stuff. Look at verse 5. In context, Paul says... These weapons of our warfare that have divine power destroy arguments and every lofty opinion. What are you talking about? Battlefield of the mind. This is all opinion, thinking, stuff in your brain. Raised against what? The knowledge of God. What does that mean? In context, the strongholds that we have divine power over, in this context, we have power over a lot of stuff, but we're going to stay in context. The divine power we have here over these strongholds are what? Arguments, lofty opinions, raised or opposed against the knowledge of God. What does that mean? Our armor... Our weapons have the divine power to cut down, to destroy strongholds of wrong thinking. This is important. Perceptions, wrong opinions that contradict the true knowledge of who God is. Going back to what you guys were saying over here, right? These wrong thinkings, these wrong perceptions, we get all discombobulated in trials, right? We start doubting the Lord. We start wondering where he is. We start trying to fix things in our own power. We get all messed up. We get all freaked out, literally make ourselves sick, right? These battlefields of the mind. How do we pull down the strongholds? He says, take every thought captive. That's how you do it. The strongholds here is your thought life. So what Paul said, your thought life that wages war against what you know is true about God. Our minds conjure up all sorts of wrong thinking, all sorts of false perceptions, all kinds of stuff, these rabbit trails, these doubtings, these insecurities, all in your mind, discouragements, all kinds of stuff in your mind that wage war against the true nature of who God is, his character, his nature, who he is. Gird up the loins of your mind and be sober minded and set your hope higher. Because if we lose sight of the rock of our foundation, which is Jesus Christ, the essence of who God is, his nature, his attributes, we are vulnerable in the battleground. Because we start to doubt who he is. 
in light of our situation, instead of holding true who he is and holding our situation up to the light of him. That's the difference. We start believing our situation and our perceptions instead of the nature of God, and it should be the other way around. That's what being sober-minded does for us to hold God's attributes and nature as the plumb line and we hold our circumstance up to it and say, okay, what about my thought process does not line up with who I know God is? That has got to go. Take the thought captive. I know that's not true. He said he will never leave me or forsake me. He has not abandoned me here. That is out. Throw it in jail. Get rid of it. That's what's going on. You guys see that? You hold it up to his nature and character and what does not pan out as true is opposed against the knowledge of God. It has got to go, right? You have your sword, which you need the word because how are you going to hold your thoughts captive against the standard of God's attributes if you have no idea what they are, right? You got to know the word. You got to be able to pull that offensive weapon off in a second, which means you got to stuff it in there in the down times, which are none. So stuff it in there all the time. There's never downtime. That's not even real. You're at war all the time. But the, the, the word is your offense and your, your prayer is that long range artillery. You can send those missiles ahead. 